Hey everybody, so if you're new here, I'm conducting a literary study between what I consider to be two of the most fascinating texts that we've seen in the last few centuries. J.R.R. Tolkien's The Book of Westmarch, which served as the purported source text for The Hobbit, The Lord of the Rings, and The Silmarillion, basically Tolkien's magnum opus, and Joseph Smith's Book of Mormon, which was published over a century earlier. So if you're just beginning to follow along, I recommend starting here. Today I wanted to highlight some of the internal details within these texts that seemingly link them to the real world. In his Joseph Smith history account, Joseph describes his experience of first learning about this ancient record by an angel when he was 17 years old. And Joseph emphatically insists on the reality of this event. He claims that this angel informed him the whereabouts of this record, which was buried in a hill nearby, and contained the account of the former inhabitants of the Americas. Beginning in September of 1823, this young farm boy insisted on both the reality of this ancient record and its purported contents of the history of ancient inhabitants that had traveled from the old world to the new world. Likewise, J.R.R. Tolkien had described on many occasions that the contents of the Book of Westmarch was an ancient account of the old world. In a personal note to himself, Tolkien referred to his work as being historically minded and that Middle-earth was in fact not an imaginary world. He reveals that his accounts happened in this world, saying it's the one in which we now live. And the essentials of Middle-earth, referring to the lands of Gondor, Rohan, and the Shire, can all be found in northwestern regions of Europe. And this is what makes the two literary works so interesting. It's these embedded elements of historicity within these accounts that give them this feeling of authenticity. For Tolkien, this became a founding principle in writing his Middle-earth legendarium. And he did this by providing various accounts with overlapping timelines, lengthy lineage histories, and the sense that each account is limited to the peripheral of its ancient record keeper, such as what we find in passages like this one. And this element of feeling like we're dealing with a limited geography narrative is particularly interesting. At one point, Tolkien explains that five divine messengers, known as the Istari, have been sent into the world by God to guide the inhabitants of the land to overcome the evils of Middle-earth. If you're at all familiar with the story, you'll recognize three of them as Saruman, Gandalf, and Radagast. And we never really learn anything about these other two. When asked, Tolkien simply explained that he didn't really know what happened to them, since they never seemed to occupy the region where Tolkien's account is unfolding. He then goes on to speculate that perhaps they had traveled to distant regions in the east and the south, far out of range where they failed in their mission and founded secret cults that perhaps outlasted the fall of Sauron. It's details like this that really demonstrate the amount of work that Tolkien put into this literary work in maintaining a narrative boundary that's limited to the knowledge of his narrators. And the more you read, the more you begin to appreciate just how deep these tales are. We find casual references in The Lord of the Rings to characters we're not familiar with, such as Arendil, Luthien, and Turin, which turns out to have their own elaborate accounts in their own right that we have not yet been told. One of my favorite instances of this happens when the Fellowship is wandering their way through the Mines of Moria. Aragorn, in his attempt to raise the group's spirit and encourage them to look to Gandalf as their guide, relates the following. He says, He will not go astray if there is any path to find. He has led us here against our fears, and he will lead us out again at whatever cost to himself. He is sure of finding the way home in a blind night than the cats of Queen Beruthiel. What's striking here is that nobody reacts to this reference to Beruthiel. We're essentially left with this feeling that everyone in the Fellowship knows who this person is and the tale that he's referring to, even though it is never explained to us, the readers. This gives us a sense that there's a more vast history to Middle-earth than we are even aware of. It is a brilliant literary detail that only further demonstrates Tolkien's ingenuity in world building. Tolkien, a middle-aged professor at Oxford University who specialized in ancient languages, texts, and translations, recognized that to make these accounts feel historical, he had to fill it with geographical references, unique languages, detailed genealogies, reckoning calendars, and peoples with their own cultures and histories. And they're drawing from their own contemporary legends and literature to deliver enriching speeches and expound on their theology. So this makes it all the more fascinating and all the more impressive when we find these elements of historicity naturally embedded in Joseph Smith's Book of Mormon. And I'm not even stretching this a little bit. Well over a century before Tolkien first begins framing his literary work, a 23-year-old farm boy in upstate New York churned out nearly a 270,000-word text in a single draft that he dictated to a scribe over the course of a little more than 60 working days. 
That alone is impressive. And like Tolkien's work, the Book of Mormon delivers converging timelines, lengthy lineage and political histories, with a sense that we're confined within the rhetorical scope and purview of its ancient authors. We see outside influences permeating into Nephite culture without any historical backdrop to where these elements are coming from. For example, well into the Book of Mormon record is one account where we are very suddenly introduced to an obscure Lamanite prophet known as Samuel that appears on the scene without any real historical introduction. He prophesies to the Nephites in their wickedness, condemns them of their actions, foretells the signs of Christ, and then flees for his life into the wilderness. And that's that. We receive no closure to Samuel's story, simply because it falls outside of Mormon's knowledge. Another example is the multiple references we find to mysterious ancient characters such as Zenos, Zenic, and Neom. In fact, Book of Mormon authors refer to the prophet Zenos at least a dozen times across five different books in the record. But here's the kicker. We have no idea who Zenos is. Based on the context, we can basically gather that Zenos must have been a prophet from ancient Israel, though he's seemingly absent from the Hebrew Bible available to us today. They more than simply refer to this unknown ancient prophet. The authors quote him extensively. One of the most well-known passages of the Book of Mormon is the allegory of the olive tree found in Jacob 5. And Jacob, rather than taking credit for this rather extensive 77 verse allegory, he explicitly attributes the whole thing to Zenos. One subtle detail about this particular passage that most readers are unlikely to even notice is that prior to Jacob delivering this lengthy and extremely thorough olive tree allegory, Jacob's father Lehi refers to the teachings and elements of this very allegory 49 chapters earlier. That is to say that years before we were even introduced to this allegory in the record, Lehi is alluding to its message to his family well beforehand, which offers us the sense that this allegory truly isn't Jacob's own creation. Like he says, it was literature that he and his family had possessed and was familiar with for many years prior. This tree analogy seems to be deeply rooted in their familial traditions, which would explain Lehi's experience of dreaming of the tree of life. It's this subtle intertextual complexity within the text that I find most fascinating about the Book of Mormon. And the fact that Joseph purportedly dictated this whole thing without any visible script before him, and then that he doesn't even seem capable of pointing out these details to his contemporaries, all the more fascinating. 